welcome to Career Biz, the weekly podcast of the University Career Center at UNC Charlotte. I'm Jay, and I'll be your host as we begin a series of special episodes spotlighting our career communities. Career communities focus on grouping similar industries and assist you in exploring your career options within these industries outside of the limits of your major. You can choose career communities by logging into your Hire a Niner account, and you'll receive resources that will help you explore your options. By selecting Into a Career Community, you get tailored career community information and events like career meetups, treks, networking events and panels, and career coaching and one-on-one appointments with our staff. Each of these episodes will feature com- for each of these episodes will feature conversations with campus representatives, industry representatives, and our career coaches. We want you to use these to explore each community's offerings so you can choose the ones that best fit your career goals. Our first featured career community is the arts, media, and design community. If you're interested in being innovative, creative, and having an impact on popular culture in your career, and if flexibility, originality, and collaboration is something you value, creative opportunities can be found in a number of sectors of non-for-profit and for-profit organizations. So we're going to try to expose you to the many facets of the arts, media, and design career community. First, you're going to hear from Stacy Kuntzman, who works with students pursuing media as a career. Stacy's going to talk about ways to build your experience portfolio and how to find those much-needed internships and ways to get yourself in front of potential companies as you want to work in media. Then we're going to have a conversation with Mr. Robin Lynn, who's a recruiter for Netflix Animation and has worked as a professional animator for a number of years himself. And then we'll wrap up by talking to A.J. Simmons, one of our career coaches dedicated to working with arts, media, and design students. And one last thing before we begin this week's episode, we are running a special contest for this week only. One lucky winner will be randomly selected to win a $15 Amazon gift card. All you have to do is subscribe to the Career Bits podcast on either Google or Apple Podcasts, leave us a five-star review, take a screenshot showing your subscription or review, and repost the picture on your story. Make sure you tag us at Niner Careers. The giveaway runs Wednesday, June 17th through Sunday, June 21st. This contest is open to U.S. only and is not sponsored by Instagram. Make sure you subscribe and leave us that five-star review and tag us at Niner Careers. We hope you enjoy these episodes and that they give you the information you need to make the best choices for you. You will hear a little transition music as we switch from interview to interview. I'll be back at the end to wrap up with a few notes and a few other things to mention. I'd like to welcome to Career Bits now, Stacey Kuntzman, the Internship Director and Senior Lecturer in the Department of Communication Studies at UNC Charlotte. Stacey, thanks so much for being a part of Career Bits and talking with us today about the arts media design community. It is my pleasure, Jay, and I really appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to uh, have a conversation about what our students can look forward to by way of internships. Yeah, we've talked a good bit about the arts and design side of things, but I wanted to include the media parts of that too for students that are interested in going into work for media and, and how fast that is changing and things. And so as the internship coordinator, you're on the front lines of seeing all the new and inventive ways that our students get involved in that, that process. Can you talk a little bit about some of the things that you've seen and what successful students look like as they're pursuing those opportunities? Absolutely, yes. And so in the media industry, you know, before the pandemic, our students always looked forward to going into the TV stations, the radio stations, and we have some excellent sponsors in the Charlotte area. And so uh, once the pandemic happened and companies began to look at ways that people could work from home, uh, the students in media were really well prepared to take that step simply because of um, who they are as students uh, in our uh, culture in which they're very hands-on with use of technology and social media. And so they were, from that standpoint, ready to step in and then what they've been learning academically in their classes. And so it the transition uh, from going into an office to working from home, for students in media, they are really right on the money when it comes. They're, they're prepared. And so what they can expect is when they're are looking for internship work. And so that's the, the, the next sort of area that, you know, is really important is not just getting that experience, but how, what does it look like? How has it changed? And so they have to begin building their portfolio very, very early on, right? And so because they have the ability 
to make news, right? They can use their phones, they can use their technology. And so it's, it's recognizing the, the multiple opportunities that are out there. You know, and I serve as the person that's an advocate. I can show you and talk to you about where the internships are located. And every major probably has got that or, or someone that fits in that role. But, you know, if they're a freshman, it's not too soon. They might not be eligible to register for an internship course where they're going to get credit. Um, and while that might be important, What's more important is getting that experience so that you can put it on your resume. And so they have to start very early in their academic career, utilizing the services through the Career Center, meeting people, networking. And again, because so much is done online now, it's perfect for students in media because, again, they are going to be the ones to step in the gap because they can produce because of digitization, right? They have the ability to make, produce, and edit their own news. I think that's what's so neat because I'm thinking back to when I was a communication student. So it seems like a lifetime ago now and how, you know, that was a much more involved process. And now, like you say, we could just do it on our phone and yes. things like that because it is so accessible to so many people. What attracts students to the field of communication studies and wanting to work as a part of media? And, and what do those successful students look like? Well, I think what attracts uh, many students to communication and media side of it is that it's it's much of what they're doing already, right? They think, well, I, I like to communicate. And so that's, you know, it's a good fit once they get into the industry uh, or in the field like you. And I know they recognize it, it the breadth and the depth. Uh, of the communication field. Um, it is what is so amazing. And, and I like to think that uh, those students in communication studies, again, are among the best prepared to fill a wide variety of roles because it is at a liberal arts degree. You know, what that means is they're being taught the, the critical thinking skills, the problem solving skills from a communication standpoint. And so, uh, you know, I think that what successful students look like is coming with into the uh, discipline with an attitude that uh, they like to communicate. They, they understand the relevancy of how we can use communication to make a difference. I mean, what we're seeing right now with everything that has happened in our culture recently, again, it's the communication scholars and professionals that have the ability to stand up, use their voice, be an advocate for those who cannot speak for themselves. So I think that our industry is going to see even more students coming into it because we're, we're Again, not the only one. Lots of folks, um, philosophy majors and, and so many different areas within liberal arts that, again, are able to um, take the courses, get the hands-on experience, to use their voices, to be an advocate for others. And so, again, I really think that within communication, we're going to see more and more students coming into our major because of these things. Or you know as well as I do that there are a lot of people that work in the field that ha that come from a variety of majors, and that's the idea of, of the career community. As a, as a writer, though, because that's the kind of the base core of everything that a good communications studies person does and a media right. person does, what are ways that if, if you can't you know, get a, a gig working for the campus paper or doing things like that, how can you, you hone your writing skills and build things? What have you seen some students do maybe a little outside of the box to help build that portfolio to get themselves ready for that yeah. internship experience? Well, it's a great example, again, because of social media sites, the opportunities to blog, to create podcasts, and we see more and more students today doing those things. That's how you begin to build your own portfolio. Find something that you like to talk about and then write about it. Create a blog, uh, create a podcast. So, so many like you, they're really good at creating podcasts and drawing in guests. And, and you don't have to go into a professional location anymore. You can do it from home. It's just a matter of finding what you like to talk about and then start writing about it. You know, and of course, academically, um, it, it's also taking those courses that force you, right? And I'm in a class right now. I have a summer class. It's an LBST class. And I love it because I have an opportunity to have students that are not just in my major. And what's really neat is we're looking at how they use communication uh, from a wide variety of disciplines to make the world a better place. And so, you know, I don't mean to veer too much from the topic, but, you know, again, I'm just really excited to see how students are going to be able to produce their own content, build their portfolio from home. 
They don't have to go anywhere. They can do it from home, do, doing research, uh, having guests uh, uh, through Zoom. That's how they start building their portfolio. They just have to take the first step and the second, it might be once a week, I'm going to do a blog. Once a month, I'm going to do a blog. Um, and then there are some who are really overachievers and they're going to do once a day, whatever. So that's what I love, again, about technology. Students can build their portfolio now, right now. That's fantastic. And, I, and great advice as well. Finding something you're passionate about, putting some energy into it, and then producing something with yes. it. How do you work with students, though, to deal with the criticism that comes with that? Not from an academic perspective, because obviously they would expect you know, grades and stuff like that. But if you put things out, I've been in this you know, space a long time, you put things out on the internet, people are going to have opinions about it. How do you deal with that and separate the constructive from the not so constructive? Well, that's that's the challenge, right? Because with online technology, of course, comes the opportunity for anyone and everyone to weigh in on what they think. And so I think it does require a thick skin. And I think that if you're in communication long enough, you, you understand that, that it comes with the territory, so to speak. I think that people have to begin to develop strategies for what they're going to pay attention to. I know me personally, that's why I hardly ever use social media. I just, I don't weigh in. I, I find that oftentimes people want to use their social media like a diary. I think people should at least be more thoughtful about what they post before they post it. Um, but on a secondary note, again, I think that when you're trying to, to in hone your writing skills, create your portfolio and those things, it would be to, to learn to try and ignore the criticism because, you know, no matter what you do, there's always going to be someone that's going to have something negative to say. And so again, my, I, I think the suggestion would be, don't look at the, the comments, right? Just don't look at them, right? For, unless you want to only focus on those comments from participants and readers that you know are legitimately unbiased and fair-minded and have feedback that they can give to you. And, it, and beyond that, ignore the rest. Don't even read them. So. I think part of that too is being a good commenter and we talk to students all the time about being aware of their presence on social media and LinkedIn, what they're you know commenting on and how they're doing that too. So kind of extending the olive branch that you hope gets extended back to you is a good way to pay it forward. Oh, absolutely. And, and having said that, part of this conversation is as these folks and students are trying to build their portfolios and what they're blogging about, it, you know, I think that inevitably it will challenge them to look at how they are commenting, what kind of communicator they are to other people in social media. And, you know, I think that all of those things work together to make them a better writer so that they are better able to look at who their audience is, uh, what they're trying to communicate, uh, and how they need to be challenged to be better communicators. Because what's fair about some comments, if, if, if readers see a bias, for example, in your writing, you know, I mean, th then that's something you have to understand is that would there be any validity to it? So I think that, again, it's, it's you just have to really, I think, just take it with a grain of salt, maybe look at the feedback, but recognize, are there any valid sort of feedback or comments there that I need to take a closer look at? And, and again, I think right now that's something all of us maybe could do. Yeah, excellent points. Stacy. once again, thanks for being a part of Career Bits. Tell folks how they can keep up with you and connect with you here at the university if they have questions. Absolutely, yes. So I am in Colvard North, and so my email is in the novel, and I can send that to you, Jay, but um, it, it's S-V-K-U-N-T-Z-M at uncc.edu. And, you know, I do my emails all the time. I have sent my cell phone number out to students. I'm not afraid to do that. I want them to have access to me when they have questions. But yeah, email is the easiest. I'm doing Zoom conferences, FaceTime, whatever. The online orientation is the best way to get the information about our program, but I'm happy to talk to any student at UNC Charlotte about internships. Thank you so much, Stacey, for being a part of Career Bits and sharing the great information. No, thanks for all you do, Jay. I appreciate you, and I hope you have a great day. Thank you. Happy to have with us on this episode of Career Bits, where we focus on the arts, media, and design career community, Mr. Robin Lynn, the manager in recruiting, outreach, and engagement professional with Netflix Animation. Robin, thank you so much for coming on and being a part of Career Bits. 
More than happy to. This has been a passion of mine since I got into the industry back in the, uh, the late 80s. Oh, fantastic. So what was the first thing I was going to start with was tell us a little bit about your background and then how long you've been with Netflix animation. Well, you know, I, I um, come from a very traditional family. My father was in law enforcement who then went into banking and kind of always looked at the arts as a great hobby for somebody right? <laughs> you know, it was never a career. It was something you did on, you know, a Saturday morning when you were a little stressed, you got out the oil paints and did whatever. Um, and unfortunately for him, he had a, a son who really was passionate about art. And, uh, and my parents, again, more traditional. So when it came to uh, advanced education out of high school, they were like, you know, that's something you should do for business. And I had no acumen for that. So I didn't continue on with my education. Instead, I got a job in banking. I thought that would be the way to go. But I kept sculpting on the side as just a hobby. And I started selling some pieces, um, much to my surprise, and got noticed by a studio head. This was, you know, it's a, a strange set of circumstances where the head of Hanna-Barbera Cartoons saw my artwork at a gift shop, liked it, called me at the bank, and offered me a job. So I went from a bank manager on a Friday to a sculptor on a, on a Monday morning and never looked back. Um, and I started off as an artist at Hanna-Barbera Cartoons, where I sculpted maquettes, uh, which are little statues that animators used to use to keep characters on model. Uh, and then kind of saw the end of that uh, when I saw a 3D output machine that was doing sculptures better, faster, cheaper than I could. So I moved over to a studio called Sony Pictures Imageworks, which did the visual effects for Stuart Little and Harry Potter and Anaconda and a number of films. And I was there for about 15 years. Um, unfortunately, I was very loyal to the president of that studio. And when the president of that studio got excommunicated, uh, you know, he and a, you know, about 150 of his friends all experienced the same. And so I went to, uh, from Sony to a studio called Real Effects, which is based in Santa Monica, California, in Texas, and helped them stand up their film division. Uh, he wanted move, me to move to Texas full time, which wasn't in the cards. Nothing against Texas, but. You know, they have weather there. We don't have weather here in Southern California, <laughs> I'll say. Uh, from there, went to um, Riot Games, and I help Riot Games. They're the largest, they have the, the largest licensed game out there in the world, a game called League of Legends, and I helped them stand up their film division, and then ended up at Netflix in 2017, and I've been there ever since. That is fantastic. I, I love the way you tell your story because it's ex, it's an example of how networking happened before we really knew what we called that right, back in the day right. where people notice your work, you have a conversation and the next thing you know, you're, you know, you're on the train. So, well, you know, it's also an example of a, a nonlinear career path. I think students think they're going to get into the industry you know, film industry, animation industry, banking, whatever industry it is and think I'm going to go from an associate to a mid to a senior to a manager all within this field, and that's so rare anymore. I think people, you know, if you were to look at my career trajectory, it looks like somebody threw spaghetti on a plate. You know, it's just going every which way. But if I look back and kind of in hindsight, I can see a pattern of where I was staying one step ahead of technology. That is fantastic, and that's a great segue into what I wanted to talk to you about because, again, our community model allows for students with any major to opt in and learn about opportunities in a community. So particularly in arts, media, and design, because my background is a little bit in communications before I got into higher ed and things like that. I worked with people that had degrees from all over the place. It was really a matter if you could write or not. Cause I started out in newspapers when those were still the thing that everybody I remember print for. media. Yeah. 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 <laughs> There's still a few hanging around. Um, but even then I saw then that a lot was changing and, and uh, I'm glad you said what you did. So I wanted to ask you what, what did you do that helped you stay on the front end of technology? And then what can students do now that seem to have access to so much of it do to stay ahead like that? You know what's funny? Um, the common denominator of all my career has been fear, right? Uh, I went through a patch when I was in my 20s where I was just dead broke. Just dead broke. And I remember finding a $5 bill in a grocery store parking lot and thinking, this is, the, you know, getting excited about a $5 bill. I went in and I bought a pineapple with that $5 bill because I was such a luxury. Um, and I kind of swore that I would never go back to being, you know, this was my, my Scarlett O'Hara, you know, God is my witness. I will never go hungry again moment. Um, 
but you know, as, as funny as it sounds, fear has been a great motivator for my career and kind of, even though I have a job that I love, always keeping an eye out for the next opportunity. And also my time at Sony, where I've been there for you know more than a decade, I got really comfortable there. And that was a fatal mistake for career growth. I have learned the minute I start getting comfortable, the minute that I start feeling I'm really good at my job, that's the time I need to pivot and pivot hard. Right? I think that that's... Yeah, it used to be an unforgivable sin when we look at a LinkedIn profile and someone was moving every three to five years. And I think now it's the unforgivable sin. We look at a profile, it's like, ooh, they've been there 10 years, 15 years. You know, they're they're going to be ossified in the way they look at the world and the way they do their job, and they're not going to be willing to change. Um, and I think that's been a big thing, that shift away from, um, you know, that, that lock stability has become, uh, it's no longer an asset. It's become a liability. So as you do recruiting outreach and engagement for Netflix animation now, what are things that you see from candidates for internships, positions, things like that, that really make their portfolio stand out? What, what makes a candidate stand out in a world today when, again, technology changes so fast it's hard to keep up with? You know, we, you know we're, we're a visual medium, so we're always going to look at the craft they create first, which is a blessing. Um, you know, we can go through a portfolio and we're not looking at, at anything other than the art. So we're not looking at where they went to school. We're not looking at, you know, their background, their economic status, any of that. We're just looking at the artwork they create. Um, and they either have it or they don't. And, and it's as sad as it is, you know, we'll look at 50 reels or portfolios. And out of that 50, maybe one has the spark um, that, that moves them forward. And, and that could be anything. It could be just they've got a different slant on the way they're looking at the world. They're using color differently. They're, there's something that makes their artwork stand out. You know, I don't know if you're a fan of music, but, you know, you can hear someone play the guitar, and then you hear someone play the guitar. And it's, you know, it, it, you can't really define what the difference is. But there's a difference there. And that's what we look for. Now, and once we start talking with people, I think, and once we get them on the phone, what we're looking for is someone who's not afraid to admit they've made mistakes, right? Um, we want someone who owns their challenges and has shown that they can overcome them. Now, the worst candidate experience for us is someone who comes in and says that they're perfect. Oh, I've never made a mistake. I'm perfect. I had a candidate say, I am perfect. I am seamless like an egg. Like, I, I don't know what to do with you <laughs> if you're coming in like that because I've never met someone who's, who's perfect like that. And I think a lot of this, you know, from the students, are, it's because times have changed and the professors are maybe using um, language that was appropriate for 10, 15 years ago. But hiring has definitely changed since then. And, and employers are looking for people who can, you know, show signs of growth. So as a student begins their journey, let's try to think about maybe our typical freshman student as they're starting sure. to explore their options and maybe they're like you and they, they realize, Hey, you know what? I, maybe I, I used to think I wanted to go into science or whatever, but I'm, I'm really passionate about art and about creating things, whether that's the visual medium or written word, mm -hmm. whatever it might be. Um, and they pursue that. What are things that that student should start doing from the get go that will position them for opportunities once they get, close to graduation and you know hit the job market certainly and this is this is great because even during this this covid time this is something you can do right start let's say that they want to be an animator let's just pick that right this is an easy one for me to talk about so they want to be an animator they've probably been watching cartoons their entire life they um they're watching movies now so they're watching whatever is you know is popular they should be looking at those credit crawls right are going on IMDb, finding an artist that created something that they like, find that person's profile on LinkedIn and ask that person for advice. Just reach out to them and say, Hey, I'm a freshman at college. I'm terrified. I'm trying to figure out what I do want to do with my life. Can you talk to me about what that was like when you were going through that? You know, start those conversations off early. Don't ask someone for a job, ask them for advice. It's easy for us to say, no, can't talk about a job. But it's really difficult for someone to say, oh, I'm not, you know, I want to give advice. I want to help people. 
Um, so reach out to the community and start opening up conversations. You know, right or wrong, most jobs go to referrals. They just do. People like to work with people they know. Well, you know, if you're just starting out in the industry, you don't really know anybody yet, but you can make those relationships. You can start planting those seeds. And, you know, so you send out 50 emails and only one gets back to you. That's still one person you know in the industry. That's 100% more than you knew the day before. Start building upon that relationship. Start showing them your work and asking for feedback. Like, here's a little scene I animated. What do you think? And they may send back notes going, you know what? This could be better. Make those changes and submit it back and say, hey, I made those changes. You know, what do you think now? Oh, that's And you're starting a dialogue. And what that's doing is it's actually mimicking the professional work environment where an artist will submit work to a supervisor, get notes, make changes, and resubmit. I'm so glad you said that because oftentimes our students have this great fear of like, oh, I can never talk to somebody that, you know, worked in some professional organization. I don't know how to talk to them. Like the majority of people that pull off the work you want to do are more than willing to conversate with you. And you've been in the business too. And I, I watch a lot of movies and stuff. Watch the animation credits at the end of a Marvel movie. There's only 400 people you could possibly connect. To. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> right. So there's a lot of people and chances are, like you said, more than one I'm as willing to, to chat with you. I think that's great advice. Well, and guess what? Their careers all started somewhere too. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, and if they didn't have someone's advice, they may have wished they did. Um, and so you're now you're giving them that opportunity to be that mentor. On the other side of that, we've, let's look at maybe students now that have built a little bit of a portfolio, that have got some experience. They're starting to look for internships and possible full-time positions. Besides being trainable and knowing that they, they've got limitations and they want to learn and things like that, what are other things that make a good designer stand out for you? Gosh, you know, um, I'll admit, like, my knowledge of the visual space is limited. I rely on my artists. I rely on our sourcing recruiters to really help me develop my eye. What I could probably speak to a, a little bit more intelligently is when that student uh, sends an email or you know sends a cover letter or a resume, and often what they do in a cover letter is they'll say something like, I just want to be a sponge. I want to come into that work environment. I just want to learn. I just want to absorb. And I just want to, you know, let's be honest, I just want to take, 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 take and help build, they would be better served if they recognized what sets them apart, what their brand is, and how they can then explain that to an employer. Like, I'm a first-time student, but I bring a wealth of experience in X, Y, Z that will make your team better from day one. If you think of a you know, work environment as like a bowl of soup, you want to be that spice that they're lacking that can come in and make that bowl better rather than being just the sponge that just takes everything out of it. And I think that first-time employees or or candidates don't understand that they have value, right? Our industry can only survive if we embrace new talent coming up into the system. Um, And so they need to get better about branding themselves and setting themselves apart. And that's all their personal experiences. Can you give a good example of someone that used a personal experience that maybe was outside of their expertise area, but it really resonated as part of their application process? You know, people like students will struggle with a resume because they'll have, I'm just a student. I've just gone to school. What they do recognize is if they're involved in their or any type of, of, you know, social program outside where they've taken the responsibility of leading a team. Like, you know, I was a camp counselor. I had 10, 14 year olds that I was responsible during the summer. Okay. If you can manage that, right. Then you know how to manage your time. You know how to mentor, you know how to lead. All of that stuff is applicable. If you're a barista at Starbucks or any of the major coffee shops, you can work under pressure. You can work with the public, right? All of that stuff is applicable. You just have to think about what your experiences are and frame them into what that studio is looking for. I'll ask you one more question too, to kind of roll back to what you started with when you talked about your background, because there's so much emphasis today on different fields and things like that. And students come in and their parents have told them a lot of things. They read a lot on you know their websites, the news, things like that. And they kind of have a sense of what the world of work is about. But 
art and media are, are, have been a part of our culture forever and they will continue to be. So how, uh, what's it like for a student to be able to have that conversation? I'm sure not too dissimilar from maybe the one you had with your folks when you switched careers about, Hey, this is what I'm really into. And there are viable careers in it. Yeah, those were those were very challenging conversations to have. You know, <laughs> my dad first. You know, my parents thought, well, he'll be a cop. My dad was a cop, so like he'll be a cop, um, and that wasn't going to happen. Um, and then, like I said, I fell into banking because I thought it was stable. And to sit down with my parents, well, you know, I'll back up even further. I didn't sit down with my parents. <laughs> you know. <laughs> 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 I don't think my, my father completely understood what being an artist was uh, in, until his passing, right? He had a, a very cop mindset. So when I started as a sculptor, at least he understood that I was making something. Hmm. He didn't understand why people paid me for it. Because he thought, <laughs> he's like, You're, you've been doing this since you could pick up Play-Doh. Why are people paying you to do it now? Because, um, you, you know, his idea of fine art was you know, a cowboy painting or something. Um, so, but he did see it. There was something tangible that I could show him. I said, dad, I spent eight hours sculpting this Yogi Bear maquette. Um, and he was amazed. Like, well, you bought a house by sculpting Yogi Bear maquettes? I, yes, just that this happened. <laughs> uh, and when I moved into management, that was something he could understand because it was, you know, it was managing a team. You know, these are the artists I work with. I do their reviews that, that he understood. When I moved into recruiting, I think I blew his mind. Because he was like, so you don't, you don't, you don't make anything anymore. It's like, no, dad, I don't make anything anymore. It's like, and you don't manage people anymore. It's like, no, I don't, I don't manage people. Like, so all you do is you hire the people who then do the work. Like, yeah, yeah, that's it. He goes, oh, so you're a pimp. Uh, yeah, thanks. Dad. <laughs> <laughs> that um, was that, that was the cop mentality. coming. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't think my parents ever understood um, what it was like to, to make that jump. Now I've counseled a lot of students who have come to me and, and ask, how do I talk to my parents about this conversation? You almost have to get spiritual in some way, because I don't think you can stop someone who wants to create art from creating art. It's just going to happen. You just have to channel it to your parents, especially if they're a little bit more conservative and not just, I mean, politically conservative, I mean, not understanding their fields outside of the workaday world mm -hmm. and break down to them sometimes just the economics of it. Like this is what this pays. You know, that, that was very helpful at some point to just sit down with, you know, these students' parents and say, let's, let's look at what an artist makes in a year versus what someone who works in a bank makes or what, you know, someone who works at a car wash or whatever. Um, it's not a bad life. It's not a bad life. It's a hard life. You know, there are more professional football players than there are professional animators. So it's, it's not an easy life and it's become more and more of kind of a gypsy lifestyle because studios no longer offer long-term contracts. You tend to bounce around a little bit, but for me, it's been just the most rewarding career I could have ever imagined. That's fantastic. Robin, thank you for spending time with us on Career Bits. Tell folks how they can follow you and your work if they choose to do so. Oh, gosh. You know, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, that's probably the only social media that I use. Uh, <laughs> it's just, it's the best thing for me. And they can, can please find me at, you know, Robin Allen Lynn, L-I-N-N, -N, at LinkedIn. And I'll be happy to add them in. Um, and if they want to shoot me questions, that's fantastic. I'd be happy to take any questions they may have. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you again, Robin, for being a part of Career Bits. Yeah, my pleasure, sir. Take care. Happy to welcome into Career Bits now AJ Simmons, who's assistant director for the Peer Career Ambassador Program and is also one of the career coaches for the Arts, Media, and Design Career Community. AJ, thanks for being on Career Bits once again. Yes, Jay, thanks for having me. I'm honored to be here and thankful for you for putting this together. Absolutely. Well, you know, the whole point of this is to give students that are already in the community or ones considering the community the options to learn a little bit more about the things we do to provide them career development and professional development resources. And so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about some of the things that you and your counterparts are working on for the summer and maybe even some of the things you've got going for the fall that students can take advantage of. Yeah, terrific. Um, so I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention my colleague, Dr. Suzanne Voigt, who is also a career coach for the arts, media and design career community. She's been doing this work for years and is phenomenal 
at uh, creating programming that will be both beneficial and developmental for the, uh, the, the growth of our students. Uh, and we have some really exciting things going on this summer. We have some really cool things that we're shaping up for the fall. So I can kind of give you an idea of some of those things. The first uh, set of series that we're really interested in unfolding here this summer is our virtual art and art history summer cool sessions uh, for creatives. And this is a partnership with Dr. Lydia Thompson in the uh, Department of Art and Art History uh, in the College of Arts and Architecture. And this is a opportunity where we're actually bringing in professionals in various arts roles that are really non-traditional. So not necessarily a um, studio photographer or a, a studio painter, but people who are coming from very nuanced backgrounds, such as um, a, a manager of art therapy in an oncology center, for instance, um, to bring them and connect them with students and share their experiences with how they got into these unique roles and the role of art and the role that art plays in our world and our society. So we're really looking forward to having these sessions. Again, these will be over the summer. We're looking to begin them uh, towards the end of this month going into July. So be on the lookout for those, of course, on Hire a Niner, as well as our website, uh, career.uncc.edu. That's just a great way for students to learn about, you know, hands-on from people that are in the field about, you know, what they're doing and, and everything. And I wanted to kind of talk to you just in your work with students that might be considering uh, opting in or being a part of the arts, media, and design industry community and career community. What are things that successful students who are in that community and the various majors that you know, exist inside of it do well? You know, that is a really great question. Uh, Suzanne and I have spent a good chunk of this summer already in, in the end of spring connecting with career services professionals across the nation at art schools as well as, uh, you know, liberal arts universities and research institutions similar to UNC Charlotte. And there are some consistent things that we've received from those conversations. The top five things that I've heard really stem around this idea of being able to market themselves. Uh, so having a understanding of, of your skill set and knowing how to push that out to potential employers as well as just other people in your network. Uh, understanding what you want to do with yourself. In the arts world, it can be a little uh, loosey-goosey, if you will, at times. Uh, these careers often are not as linear as, say, maybe a, an engineering career. Uh, so having a clear plan for what you want to do with yourself or at least uh, having some idea of that is a is a helpful kind of uh, mindset to have. Um, being able to plan very well is something that we've seen has been helpful for individuals uh, as well as marketing themselves. And then finally, being able to network. And I think that's something that comes uh, that, that is relevant regardless of, of what you're studying. Um, but especially salient for our art students who, quite frankly, need to be able to network and get in front of people so that they can get their work out, so that they can show their worth and help others to understand the value that they bring. And AJ, what are ways that the Career Center can help students throughout all of those processes? The, everything you've mentioned there, it sounds like programs we've got or meetups we hold things on. What are different ways we can help them do that so that students realize, hey, you don't have to figure all that out on your on your own? Well, Jay, that is an excellent segue. Um, we do have a series of career meetups that we're doing this summer. Um, and, and again, these career meetups are short conversations, small group discussions, 30 to 45 minutes, where we talk about these sorts of things. And just to give you an example, some of the ones that I'll be leading this summer are uh, the art of selling yourself, um, you know, Body language, two thousand, and in, in many cases we have this uh, this one thousand level, right? Like eye contact and so on. But we're going to take that to the next level, the two thousand level, uh, if you will. Uh, and, and again, this is something that's helpful for everyone, but art students in particular. Uh, we we have a meetup regarding on campus employment for students interested in arts, media, and design. So identifying those opportunities on campus, as well as in the uh, in the the heat of what we're experiencing, you know, both nationally and globally, we're leading some meetups on using your art to create sustainable social change. And we've seen 
artists take a role uh, here in Charlotte as well as across the nation with that? Yeah, and I think that's so important to to mention. We we often hear it said here and there, but the role of art and media and design in our culture cannot be downplayed and how important it is in delivering messages and in telling stories that don't get told enough. And I think that's why it's such a, a viable option still for a career. So could you speak to that a little bit? You know, I know a lot of students sometimes have to go home and have the conversation with mom and dad about, okay, this is what I'm going to go and do. And you know, it's not as linear as being, you know, something else. So how, how, uh, what are some good strategies for having that talk and having that conversation with, with folks? Yeah. um, That's a great question. I think the number one thing, and this is what I try to share with students as often as possible is understanding the value that you bring, understanding your worth. The thing about artists and, and and we'll use the term creatives because really this, this is going to include our designers. This is going to include our, our media folk. The thing about our creatives is they are able to envision a world that has not yet happened. And that is a talent, that is a skill, uh, that is a quality that many people do not have. Uh, and, and it should be emphasized because it's important. The same way that an engineer can uh, construct something that will be useful, a bridge or a building, a, an artist can help inform that design, or an architect obviously would help inform that design. Um, the same way that, you know, maybe a biologist might be able to think differently about approaching, say, um, you know, some sort of a disease control or so on. Um, an, an artist or somebody in the media is, is fully capable of, of envisioning ways in which we can solve problems as well. And I think that's what it comes down to is, is solving the problems that we have, which is going to take people from all sorts of fields. Um, and understanding that you have value. So if you're having those tough conversations with your parents, um, just just try to kindly remind them that you have a lot of value, a lot of worth that you're able to give, and you're still exploring that, as, as many of us are. Even even those people who are in linear paths, they're exploring themselves as well. Um, so so give, ask them to give you a little grace as you're going through that exploration and that creative process. I think that's great advice, AJ. And I mean, as we both know, you know, many times people take nonlinear paths to get where they're going. And again, arts, media, and design certainly has a number of opportunities for students to explore. Tell folks how they can keep up with you and how they can make appointments with you, check in with you if they want to talk more about their career journey. Excellent. Yes, um, you can always visit Hire a Niner and uh, select Talk with an Arts, Media, and Design Coach. And then from there, you can select to either meet with me, A.J. Simmons, or uh, Dr. Suzanne Voigt, my colleague. Um, and, you know, just whenever you schedule that appointment, go ahead and, and put in the notes exactly what you would like to talk about. And uh, let, let us know if you'd like to have this conversation either virtually through WebEx or over the phone. We can accommodate either of those methods. And in the fall, uh, we will, we will uh, have some availability uh, in the office as well. So. Uh, but either way, you'd need to visit Higher Niner to go ahead and schedule that appointment. Fantastic. AJ, thanks again for being a part of Career Bits, and especially this episode where we spotlight arts, media, and design career community. Thanks so much, Jay. And uh, art students, media students, design students, uh, we don't bite. We will be coming around uh, row building. So if you see us, Suzanne and myself, please stop and say, hey, we may have some treats for you even. So that will wrap up our arts, media, and design career community episode. Hope you found the information and the interviews enjoyable and informative. As always, please subscribe to the podcast wherever you find it. And you can keep up with the Career Center on social media at Niner Careers. And of course, through our website, career.uncc.com.